Okay. All right, open your Bibles. Just open them for now. <laughs> Just open them. I'll tell you where we're going in a little bit. Because I'm not really sure where we're going to go today. We're talking about the essentials. Can anybody name some of the essentials that we've covered so far? What was the first essential we covered? The inerrancy of the Word of God. Why did we cover that first? Because that's what everything is based on. Because everything else comes out of this. We have to know we can trust this. We have to believe what it says, because otherwise, every other essential is suspect. Okay? So we talked about the inerrancy of Scripture in the original language. And I, I specify the original language because some of you go, well, mine says charity and hers says love. Whose is right? Yup, both. Okay? The original language. God chose the Hebrew, the Aramaic, and the Greek because they were the most efficient language to do what he wanted done. Okay? He didn't choose English because, quite honestly, English is stupid. <laughs> it's a hodgepodge. It's a mix. We take words from half a dozen different languages and throw them together and make a new language. Okay? So, when we try and take from the pure Greek and try and render it into the English, that's why there's confusion. Okay? Now, can we trust that this word is true? Absolutely, because it's the same God. Uh, that, that's quite honestly one of my dilemmas with, with some of the cults that are out there. They say, oh, you can't trust this word because at some point in time it got corrupt. Well, God says in this word that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God will stand forever. And if your God is not capable of keeping his word intact, I don't want to serve your God because he's not all-powerful. Okay? My God is all-powerful. He speaks and it happens. Nobody can change what he sets out to do. Okay? So, the inerrancy of Scripture. Then, what, what's another one? What else did we cover? Wow. Well, I, okay, one at a time. <laughs> I, I heard mono-virgin birth. <laughs> <laughs> Which is true, there was only one. <laughs> Okay, we talked about monotheism, the idea that there is one God, but we understood that even in his revelation as one God, it's always one God in a plurality, which brought us to the Trinity, three gods, coexistent, co-eternal, in one, okay? So we talked about monotheism and the Trinity, we talked about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and how... They work cooperatively together. How each one is unique unto themselves, but they are all one God. Okay? We talked about the Son being sent to earth. That he was... Okay. Come on, Vivian. Fully God and fully man. Okay? 100% God, not reduced in any way but also 100% man with all the vulnerabilities that you and I have. It said that he suffered every temptation known to us and yet did not sin. Okay? So we talked about the virgin birth. We talked about his perfect life, death, burial, and resurrection. That led to the nature and condition of man, which is stinky. We all stink. Okay? We are an unpleasant aroma in the nostrils of God in our natural state. Okay? We talked about what sin is. All right? Missing the mark. We've all offended God. Every one of us. Okay? And yet, we didn't end there, because if it ended there, there'd be no purpose for this gathering. We talked about the redemption that brings us right before God, and we, we base that on 2 Corinthians 5.22, that God made him who knew no sin to be sin, that we might become 
the righteousness of God in Christ. Okay? So we talked about how God doing something only God could do that we could never do. We could never reconcile the relationship with God because we're corrupt. How can the corrupt approach the incorruptible? So God reversed the order and he allowed corruption onto his son that made a way for us. And we have been redeemed. We have been reclaimed. We have been bought out of slavery. We have been made his very own. Okay? Well, that brings us to the end. And last week we talked a, a, a bit about, um, a bit, a bit, a bit, <laughs> every once in a while I revert to Porky Pig. <laughs> um, we talked a bit about Jesus coming back. Now, the essential is to believe that he is coming back. The non-essential is when. Don't get so hung up on people with their different views of when he came back or when he's coming back or what. The, the, the idea is he is coming back to claim his own. That's what we have to agree on. Okay? Because really when it comes down to it, as well thought out and as well reasoned your arguments are, one of these days, we're all going to stand before him and realize how badly we all missed it. That's grace. That in spite of how badly we all miss it, he still loves us, he still covers us, he still holds us in his hand. Okay? So now we're going to talk about the end of all things. Eternity. Now actually, I've had a couple of people tell me, well, eternity isn't really a necessity. And I just look at them like this. <laughs> Really? So if eternity is not a necessity, Jesus came and died on the cross for my 70 years. And that's it? Um, do you know how many scriptures I can go through and cross out now? And we're going to talk a bit about that today. Why is eternity an essential? So let's look at this. Now, I came up with three reasons. Now, I'm sure you guys can go out, you can examine some of the great thinkers, Christian theology, uh, some of the great uh, men of doctrine, and they're going to come up with better reasons than I have, well more thought out. They're going to use bigger words. But here's the three reasons that I came up with, and we're just going to go through them one by one. One, why is eternity an essential? One, because it reveals to us the transcendent nature of God. Okay, you go well, the transcendent. Remember, we talked about transcendent nature of God that He is above us. He's like so far beyond us that we can't really even fathom Him. That's that's the transcendent nature of God. God both always was and will always be. He has no beginning. He has no end. See, time is something that we are stuck in. God is not stuck in it. He exists outside of it. He created it. Okay? And he exists in all time, all the time, fully. So God is fully here with us in this moment, as he was the moment I just said this moment. And he's still there, and he's still here. And he was there with me when I was on my face crying out to him for salvation, and he's still fully there. And he will be fully there when I'm on my face crying for forgiveness. He fully exists in all time because time has no hold on him. Okay? So eternity, we have to believe eternity because we serve an eternal God. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting you are God. From everlasting at the, before the beginning to everlasting after the end, you are God. Now keep in mind, we have a lot of beginnings and endings in Scripture. What are those there for? What are those there in reference to? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Wh who is that referring to? Our Us. Okay, that's there to give us a frame of context in which to operate because we got small brains. 
okay? And the small brains that we have, we don't even fully use. And sometimes we don't use at all. So God always puts in a frame of context to make us able to grasp, to be able to handle things. Because how can the finite comprehend the infinite? Okay? We use terms like uh, as vast as the sum of the oceans. But, but really, it's, it's more vast than that because we can, we can count the ocean. We can, we can see. I mean, you go up in one of those satellites and you look, Google Earth. Look, there, there it is, and it goes up to there, and it kind of leaks up there, and, and comes down here, and you can see the sum of the ocean. And God is beyond that. The infinity of space. Well, space isn't infinite. We just haven't found the end of it yet. God is infinite. Okay? So, why is eternity? Because it shows us the transcendent nature of God. Um, Isaiah 57, 15 says, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up. Just for clarification, the one who is high and lifted up is God. Okay? He's not talking about a particular king. He's referring to God. Who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. Now, I, I left that last part in there because it, I just, it touches me. That the eternal God, who inhabits eternity, who is forever, is close to me when I'm low. That he, he steps into my life, into my time, and deals with me. Okay? And that's awesome. And I, I, I have to tell you, I overuse the word awesome, and we overuse the word awesome in English language. Did you see that play? That was awesome! These are awesome tacos! <laughs> I don't care how good the tacos are, and I don't care how good the play was. In light of how awesome God is, and, and that's a word that we use to describe God, awesome, to, to, to describe God, awesome. Doesn't that kind of demean the word, the value of the word? Reducing it? Because then, do we really want to equate God with tacos? Sometimes. <laughs> you hope. <laughs> Deuteronomy 33.27 says, The eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he thrust out the enemy before you and said, Destroy. Listen. Did you catch that? The eternal God is your dwelling place. Isn't that cool? The eternal God is your dwelling place. See, you see the, the contrast that is going on in these, these couple of passages here? We have a God that is so big. He's eternal. He's infinite. And yet he's coming down and he's interacting with us and he's engaging with us with animated dirt. You get that? Yeah. You understand that's what we are. We're animated dirt. Well, we're kind of a little bit more than that because, you know, God shaped us and formed us out of the dust of the earth, but then he did something special to us. He breathed his life into us. Okay? So, he, he comes down and he's intimate with us. Number two, why do I think eternity is an essential? <clears throat> Salvation is unto eternity and not just to the end of this life. The plan of redemption that God has enacted is eternal, not temporary. Okay? It's eternal. Now, last week I mentioned three different parts of essentials, and I, I want to go over them again because I don't want you to be confused about something. See, there is essentials for justification. Now, we talked about that, the redemption of man. There are essentials for identification. Whose are you? To whom do you belong? And then there are essentials for glorification. Okay? Now, do you realize that we have not yet been fully glorified, right? 
right? Because if, if this is fully glorified, I'm disappointed. And I know you are too. Okay? So there is an essential unto glorification that we have to believe. And this is why eternity is so important. Okay? Because when God enacted the plan of salvation, it wasn't so you'd live out a really super cool life. As a matter of fact, when we look through the book of Acts, we see a lot of the men that were saved didn't have that great a life. Go look at Paul's defense of his ministry. Whipped and scourged and beaten and stoned and shipwrecked and cast out? Who wants a life like that? <coughs> well, let me quote a scripture. I want to know him not only in the glory of his resurrection, but also in the fellowship of his suffering. Also in the fellowship of his suffering. That I might somehow attain the resurrection. Not that I have already attained it, but that I might attain it. Okay? See, God, there's a horrible doctrine that is so readily accepted and eagerly awaited in the American culture because we're all about promotion of self. Okay? We're all about self here. We, we've graduated from, and I use the term graduated sarcastically, we've graduated from a society of hardworking people that worked to get what we wanted to a, a civilization of hedonists. Do you know what the term hedonist means? Welfare. Okay. <laughs> kind of. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Pleasure. Let's live it up. Pleasure. Every kind of pleasure you can imagine. That's what we want. And we pursue it. Okay? And then, that's bad enough as a culture without Christ, but we have Christian churches that are embracing that idea that somehow or another, if you embrace Christ, you'll get the lifestyle you really want. When the entire understanding of embracing Christ is to deny yourself. Deny yourself. I, I, heard, I heard a sermon. Actually, I heard a snippet of a sermon. I got to this point in the sermon, and I couldn't listen anymore. Where a pastor was talking about, because of his faith in Christ, he got a boat. Now, don't get me wrong, because I believe there are people that sometimes God gives a boat to. But his son wanted a boat. And his dad told him, you need to pray for a boat. And he heard his son praying, God, I want a raft. That I can go out and I can pat his dad. So don't pray for a raft. Pray for a boat. We want a 44-footer. <laughs> Look. When we do our marriage class, I always start off by saying this. The Lord tells you it's all about you. Our culture tells you it's all about you. And I want to tell you, it is not all about you. It's all about you. And I'm going to turn this thing completely around because our culture tells you it's all about what you get. Gimme, 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 gimme. We never really get past that two-year-old stage. Mine! 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 We, we never really move past that, do we? Because we pursue what we want. And we're frustrated because we don't have more. And then we get what we think we want. And then we're frustrated because we want the next one. <coughs> and God says, you should want Him. Above everything, desire Him. I believe, I, I might be wrong, but I believe it was Corey Tenboom that said, I have learned to hold things loosely, for it hurts when he opens my hand to take them back. <laughs> hold things loosely. Look, I, I challenged you last week, and I'm going to challenge you again. 
because this is a challenge that God is taking me through. And I believe according to his word, it's a challenge every one of us should be mindful of every day. Last week I had you make a list of things that were important in your life. And then I asked you, could you give those up and replace them with God and have more joy? Because see, if you can't, if you can't give up your family and replace them with God and have more joy, then your family's an idol to you. <coughs> if you can't give up your TV show, and I, I, to be honest with you, I don't even know what TV shows are on, are on anymore. But if you can't give that show up and replace it with spending time with God and find more joy, then you have an idol. Okay? And so we have this idea that if you come to God, everything is going to be peaches and cream, a bed of roses. Any of you ever laid in a bed of roses? <laughs> really? What, a, what an asinine statement. <laughs> Life is a bed of roses. I tell you what, my dad had a rose garden. I fell in it once. And it was no bed of roses. It was scratches and sticks and pokes and, and then a beating. <laughs> you like roses. <clears throat> okay? But we have this idea that if you come to Christ, everything's going to be perfect. He didn't say everything was going to be perfect. He said he was going to walk with you through everything. He would give you the strength to get everything, get through everything. He was going to be with you and never leave you or forsake you. Okay? When you come to the cross, you come to die. You have to have that firmly fixed in your mind. Okay? He who would save his life must lose it. Okay? So, if you hear people espousing a gospel that is talking about come to Christ and get this and you should have that and you should... I actually had a lady tell me once uh, we, our car died and we had no vehicle and, and uh, we were actually, God told us that he wanted us to take an evangelism trip. I said, God, about as far as we can go, we were living in Victor at the time, is maybe Florence, because I think I could walk to Florence. <laughs> he said, no, you're going to go to Denver and you're going to go to Oklahoma. We prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed, and it was how many days before we left? I think about a week. About a week. It was actually, I was thinking it was about four days before we left. We still had no vehicle. Now, we were still praying. Okay, God, you want, plans were in place. We had the churches lined up. We had, had people that were waiting for us, and we were looking at walking. <laughs> and we had kids <clears throat> that didn't walk. <laughs> Thinking, I can, not only do I got to walk, I got to carry kids. <laughs> and we were praying, okay, God, you have called this thing into being. If this is you, you got to open the door. And we got a call from a gentleman in our church, and he said, uh, he said, I've got a, a car that uh, I bought just for driving around while I was in town. He said, I don't need it anymore. Um, I would like to give it to you. It's a 1977 Ford LTD Country Squire panel station wagon, <laughs> and it weighs 4,000 pounds. <laughs> And he said, I just want to give it to you. It's, it's yours. And we drove that car to Oklahoma and back. And boy, was that an experience. Because that car, well, I tell you what, driving down I-25 toward Denver, and it died. And there was smoke, and there's things, and <laughs> And it was awesome, because it was like driving a tank, because the steel-belted radials had all broken. So <laughs> we're driving, though. We are not walking. <laughs> and so we pulled over to the side of the road and we got out and there was, you know, you know how many of you went to the fair? Down there, you know, did you, did you see the carnies? Did they scare you? <laughs> A caravan of carnies pulled over. <laughs> Sweetie, roll up the windows and lock the doors. <laughs> Lay on top of the children. <laughs> no, they pulled over, and I, quite honestly, Scripture tells us that we should be.
be on our guard because we oftentimes entertain angels unaware. I am convinced that some angels have tattoos and bad teeth. <laughs> <laughs> because those, those people got out, they came walking up, no tools in hand, no tools in hand, came walking up, fiddled around with the engine for a little bit, said, here, that'll get you where you're going. Got in their car and drove off, shut the hood, car started up, and our tank was on its way. <laughs> okay. Uh, got into town, and my brother made the mistake of driving my car. He had to move it, and so he needed to take it around the block, and he said, how, how long has it been driving like that? Well, since we've had it. I said, that's like driving a tank. I said, I wouldn't know. I've never been in a tank. That's how I know it's like a tank. And, and he and his wife blessed us with four new tires. And so we drove down to Oklahoma, and we came back. And I was working for a lady, and she told me I did not have enough faith to get a good car. I said, you know what? My request was not for a car. My request was for transportation. God, I need to get from point A to point B, and you make a way. And God provided this car, and I am not going to look down my nose on the car that has since been dubbed the banana boat. Okay, because it was yellow. And like I said, it weighed 4,000 pounds, and it had a propensity for dying at the bottom of a hill, not at the top. And my kids, you, you wonder why Christopher's so big? It's because at six years old, he was helping me push a 4,000 pounds. <laughs> Okay? Now, my point is this. A lot of people look at that car and say, that's not God's best. That's not God's best for you. It answered a desperate prayer and need in our lives at that time. And we were so very grateful that God answered our prayers. Okay? I didn't need a Cadillac. Quite honestly, I couldn't have afforded a Cadillac. God gave us what we needed when we needed. Okay? So, as far as this idea, you come to Christ, you turn your life over to Him, and, and life is going to be peaches and cream, which I've never had that. Is that good? Because <laughs> no. it doesn't even sound good to me. Okay. I'm taking your word for it because I look at that kind of like a bed of roses. So, if you come to Christ, you come to him to die. Okay? Understand that. God is generous. He's gracious. But quite honestly, if he stopped at the cross and never did another thing for you, you would still owe him your lives. Amen. Okay? Amen. All right. So let's move forward. Uh, John 3, 14 through 17. Go ahead and flip over there with me. Now that your Bibles are open and they're warmed up. John chapter 3. I'm going to start in verse 14. And this is Jesus speaking. Uh, he's talking to Nicodemus. And he's saying, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And what, what is this? I mean, at the very beginning of his ministry, Jesus is already talking about the crucifixion. Okay? And he says, uh, So must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have a good life until they die. <laughs> may have peaches and cream and a bed of roses until they die. Can have a Cadillac instead of a Ford LTD Country Squire paneled station wagon until they die or it dies, which it did. <laughs> now what does he say? Eternal life. Eternal life. Okay? But he goes on. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have... Well, I thought it was a Cadillac. Or a 44-foot boat. Or a bigger house than I've got now. Or a nice, fat bank account. No. He says they would not perish, but have 
eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Okay, so you get the picture how long the salvation is for? Eternity. Eternity. Okay. Now, just to clarify something, we're not God. We will never become God. We will never become gods with a little g. Okay? There was, there's been some misteaching out there that somehow or another we're going to ascend to something better as far as what we are. Yeah, that this, this will change. Quite honestly, I don't think it's going to be so much the physical thing that's going to change. I think we're just going to be radiant because of being in the presence of God. And quite honestly, when you're in the presence of God, who's going to look at each other anyway? I mean, we get to heaven, you're not even going to pay any attention whether or not I got a bald spot. Because you're going to be looking at God. Okay? For eternal life. Okay? So let's look, uh, flip over to 1 Corinthians if, uh, with me, if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to start in verse uh, 12, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 15, uh, I'm sorry, let me try this again. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we of all people are most to be pitied. Do you get what's, what he's saying here? This is probably one of the most significant passages for why eternity is essential. Okay? Let me, let me reread this last line. Okay? It says, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Do you see what Paul is saying there? Look, if salvation, if the cross, if the resurrection... <coughs> is only impactful in this life only, and then we go to the grave and that's it, then we are to be most pitied. Now think about the people that he's comparing us to. And the pity that we have for them. And he says we should be pitied even more. See, this is why eternity is so important. Why is it essential? Because salvation was not intended just for this life. And that's why I say, man, when somebody has a deathbed conversion, don't doubt, praise God. Amen. Oh, and it never stuck. It didn't need to stick. It took him to the end. It's just as far as it needs to go. All he's got to do is get us to the finish line. Oh, ah, if that's the case, I'm just going to wait till the end. Yeah. Like you're going to have a moment to think about that when you get hit by a truck. Because you don't know how you're going to end. Besides, that's fire insurance. That's not relationship. Okay? God hasn't called us to fire insurance. He's called us to relationship. All right. So the first reason, because it reveals the transcendent nature of God. Second reason, because salvation is unto eternity. Third reason, here's the kicker, because there is going to be a final judgment taking place. 
once and for all. Okay? And the final judgment renders unto eternity all people. All right? Okay? Now, you understand, we just read in, in John that Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. Why? Because the world was already condemned. The moment sin came in, they were already condemned. God had already rejected them. Okay? So, when we sit here and we go, Oh, do you see what so-and-so did? Look, if they're in the church, then we go to them and we confront the sin. And the only time it should ever be brought up before the church is after the process laid out in Scripture has been gone through that the church might render judgment. What is the purpose of the judgment? In the hope that they will return to Christ. Okay? But if they're in the world, you're wasting your breath. You're wasting your breath. When you go out and you condemn the people going in and out of the abortion clinics, you're wasting your breath. They are already condemned. God has done that. What can you add to God's judgment? Can you add anything to his judgment? God, I know you've already rendered yours, but let me help you out. Shame, 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 shame. Me and you, God, we got it. I wish my nose were longer so I could look further down it. <laughs> uh, but really, I'm sorry, I just flung your purse over there. I didn't even realize it was under there. <laughs> what can we add to God's judgment? Okay? When Christ came, he called it like it was. He didn't dwell on their sin. He didn't back away from it either. I mean, look at, look at the, the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. He says, go and get your husband. Oh, I'm not married. <laughs> you're right, you're not married. You've been married five times. And the man you're living with isn't your husband. Did Jesus back away from their sin? Absolutely not. But he let it be what it was. He didn't dwell on it either. Why? Because he didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. We are to be ambassadors of God's judgment. I got it this time. Did God call us to this place? Whoa. <laughs> See, that's, that's a problem with standing up on soapboxes. Did God call us there? No, where did God call us? Let me show you where God called us. That's where we belong. Okay? God has called us to intercede. He's called us to pray. He's called us to be ambassadors of the message of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5. Our job is to go out and share the gospel. They know they're lost. Why do you think that one of the largest departments in any bookstore is the self-help department? Yeah. You want one that's larger than that? Romance! Why? Because people are looking for something. People are longing for something. The God-shaped hole is yet to be filled. Matthew 25. Flip over, or, um, yeah, flip open with me. Matthew 25. Now, I gave you homework last week to read Matthew 24. Did you get it done? Yes. All right. Matthew chapter 25. I'm going to start in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory 
and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Now, do you notice who's excused, who's excluded from this list of people? No one. Nobody is excluded. Everybody is here. And he separates them. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Now, I'm not going to illustrate that because I don't want you guys getting cocky. And I don't want you guys feeling bad. Because I'm not Jesus. Okay? But he's going to separate them. Then the king will say to those on his right. Now, who's the king? Jesus. Jesus. Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying... Now, do you get what he says there? The righteous. That goes back to what we talked about. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. Perfect, pure, the righteousness of God. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord... When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Okay? You see, you see what's happening here? Now, don't get confused. This isn't about works. Okay? Because Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10, makes it very clear. Salvation, <coughs> remember what we said? Grace plus faith equals salvation. Arrow, then we work. Work is not part of the equation unto salvation. Works is a result of salvation. You apply that same formula here. Those who were saved did the work that the Master had called them to do. Those who were not saved did not do the work. Why? Because they weren't saved. <laughs> Simple math. Simple math. Okay? So, and where did they go? Unto eternal punishment or unto eternal <coughs> life? Romans chapter 14 says... Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For, you will, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so that each of us will give an account of himself to God. Now, see, here's, here's kind of the cool thing, because you realize that there's, there's two judgments, and I, I actually I don't like the term two judgments, because the first judgment really kind of casts kind of an unfavorable light on the second judgment. I like to call it a judgment and an award ceremony. Okay? Because those, the first judgment is going to re be rendered unto those who have salvation and those who do not. It's the separation of the, the sheep and the goats. But then the sheep will be judged according to what they did to receive their reward. Okay? 
Now, you go, oh, I don't do it for reward. I just do it because I love Jesus. Well, the Jesus you love made it important. So it should be important to you. Why? Oh, man, I'm stocking up my bank account in heaven. What do you need to buy in heaven? <laughs> what, 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 what's there going to be to buy? Everything we have is for the sole purpose of what? That's exactly right. Casting it at his feet. Okay? I want to have much to cast at his feet, not little. I don't want to pull out my two coppers and lay them at his feet. Man, I want to have wheelbarrows full. Not because of me. Not because I want to exalt me. But because he's worthy of wheelbarrows full. Okay? So the second judgment is for the rewards. Let's move forward. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what is done in the body, whether good or evil. 1 Peter 4 says, But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. You get that? Remember going back to our resurrection passage? If they're gone and there is no resurrection, why would the dead need be judged? Hebrews 9, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? See, we have the salvation of our souls in eternity, but God is going to come and save the entirety of us. He is going to come back someday and claim his bride. And I'll tell you what, it's going to be ugly in the world at that time. It's going to be ugly for the church, but that ugliness is going to produce a beautiful, spotless bride for the Savior. You understand that? You understand that? That before Jesus comes back, he's going to allow things to happen to the church, that the church will be purified. Okay? You're not purified with just sprinkling over a little bit of water. How do you purify gold and silver? You put it through the fire. Okay? The hotter the fire, the more dross comes out, the purer the gold when the process is done. And it's going to be hard on the church both outside and inside, because there are going to be those that are going to come in, wolves in sheep's clothing, that are going to spread lies, that are going to start tickling people's ears. Boy, we don't see that today, do we? <laughs> come to my church. <laughs> He's never coming back. <laughs> Every week he still sits here. <laughs> See, that it's not going to be just the outside coming against the church. It's going to come up, it's going to well up within the church as well. Okay? It's going to well up in between people because all of a sudden issues that are not issues are going to become issues. And, and really what's going to happen is the church is going to have to humble itself. We as Christians are going to have to humble ourselves and be willing to consider others better than ourselves, to look to their needs before our needs, to not even consider our needs, because why? We trust those to God. Remember Jesus told us that in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. God has taken care of all these things. If we could really learn that idea of not worrying about our needs or what we think are our needs or what are really our wants, but because we want them so badly, we classify them as needs... If we could really live the life that God has called us to live, if we could really be the people that God has called us to be, what would there be to fight over? Really, I mean, if, if I could really be that humble, what could my wife do that would be an offense to me? Really? I mean, 
wow, babe, this is the third time in a row you've burned dinner. God didn't tell me that the food that he was going to give me wasn't going to be burned. He just told me he was giving me food. <laughs> Paul said, he knows what it's like to be hungry. Well, I got food. Really, if I could get to the point where I could live that life, what could she do to offend me? You know, in, in both Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, it reminds us to not be easily offended. Don't be quick to take offense. Okay? Don't be quick to take offense. So, moving forward. I know I'm hitting a lot of scriptures. If you want these references after, please come and talk to me. I'll get these to you. Um, uh, Acts chapter 17 says, The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this... Uh, and of this he has given assurance to all by the raising, by raising him from the dead. Okay. Now, I want you to understand something right here. First, there is a day that God has already picked. God's not up there getting up in the morning and going, hmm, what should I do today? Well, it's kind of a slow day. Maybe I'll just render the final judgment. He has a day that is picked. We do not know that day. All right? We don't know. We live as though today were that day. Every single day. Do you understand that? We have to. Because we don't want to be like the servant who thought his master was not going to return and started squandering his master's property and abusing his master's servants. We don't want to be like the five virgins who didn't bring enough oil to keep the lamps lit throughout the night. We don't want him to come back and be found wanting. We want to be prepared for his coming. We should be looking forward with eager anticipation to his coming. Also with dread. You understand that? That's the strange dichotomy of this whole thing. This is what should drive us. This is the dynamo that should drive us. Because while we wait and eagerly anticipate his coming, hoping that it would be even now, we dread that same thing because people we love will be cast out. <coughs> See, that's the dynamo. That should be the motivation for <coughs> us to be about the master's work. To be the ambassadors of the message of reconciliation. To take advantage of every opportunity to not let one slip by doesn't matter if they reject it that doesn't matter to me because my job is to deliver the message it is my hope and prayer that they would receive it but ultimately that's between them and God it's not a personal affront to me do you, you understand that it's not a personal affront to you if they reject your message. It's not a personal affront to you if they abuse you, if they say evil things to you, if they smack you around. It is not a personal affront to you. It's an affront to God because it's Him they're rejecting. All you are is the messenger carrying the message from Him to them. Okay? We have a story about this in the Bible that is very, very clearly illustrates this, and, and this has just come to my mind. I'm, I'm off track a little bit, so bear with me. Uh, David was king in Israel. Things were going well. Uh, he had subdued all the nations around them. One of the nations, uh, the king died. I believe it was the king of Aram. I might be wrong. His son rose to power. David sent some ambassadors to greet him and say, congratulations on being made king. We're sorry for the death of your father. And this, this new king, his friend said, hey, look, David's sending these guys to spy out your land. He's going to come and conquer you. Now that your father is gone, he wants to destroy you and take your kingdom from you. 
And so they convinced him to shamefully treat with those ambassadors. And they shaved their beards and they cut off the back of the robes at the butt cheeks and turned them loose. And, and this was shameful. And David got wind of it. And he called him and he said, stay here until your beards grow back. And then he gathered his army for war and he went out to face them. Why? Because was the offense against the ambassadors? No. The offense was against David, who sent them in his place. So when they come against you and they say evil things against you, you deliver the message. You are faithful to the commission that God has given you. And if they give offense, you understand. We have to understand. It's not an offense against me. I didn't die for them. I didn't go to the cross for them. He did. So the offense is his. And not only is the offense directed at him, but he's also offended on your behalf because you're faithful to do what he's told you to do. Okay? So, moving forward. Wow, okay. Last one, Revelation chapter 20. Turn there with, you, with, with me if you would. Revelation chapter 20. <laughs> Verse 11. <clears throat> then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now see, a lot of people get confused here because he's going on and it says, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. But see, that wasn't what determined whether or not they were cast out. The only book that mattered as to whether or not they were cast out was the book of life. So there are a lot of people that are going to stand before the great white throne and be judged. Wow, Gandhi, you did great things. Wow, you really had a heart for the poor. You were doing fantastic. You went out of way to, to bless them. You lived a life of poverty that you might be able to enrich the lives of others. But you know what? You're not in this book. Out you go. And, and you notice the term here? He was thrown into the lake of fire. You're not quite the escorted. You are being utterly and quickly ejected from the presence of God. Out. Okay? Now, I, I, I will confess to you, when I actually started doing this message, I had written up uh, several messages, two messages, on heaven and hell. And what they were like. And the descriptions that we have from them in scripture, and... Um, you know, the eternal glory and the eternal lake of fire. And, and as I was going through them, I realized that a lot of what I was putting into them was not essential. It's important, yes, but it's not essential. What's essential is we understand that there will be a final judgment unto eternity between the righteous and the unrighteous. And the only way we are righteous is because of the righteousness he gives us, his righteousness, through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. Okay? That's it. That's the only determining factor for salvation unto eternity with God. That's it. Do you have the blood of Jesus? Okay? That's it. Then there will be another judgment whereby you will determine the works that you've done. That are, are, they're going to be held, by, held to the fire. All right? Some of us are going to have our works held to the fire, and it's going to be like rice paper. <laughs> Gone. 
And we'll have nothing to take into eternity with us to lay at the feet of Jesus. Others, we're going to have stuff put in the fire and it's going to come out as pure gold. And we'll be able to lay that at the feet of Jesus. That's not what determines whether or not we're in heaven. That's what determines what we have to lay at his feet. Okay? So we have to understand eternity is important. It's essential for us to understand that there is an eternity. And it's either unto eternal life or unto eternal punishment. Okay? Got it? The end. <laughs> the end. Because that's it, in a nutshell, the essentials of our faith. <clears throat> now, there are a lot of things that are important. Lots and lots of things that are important. But these are the things we have to agree on to fellowship and worship together. Okay? All right. Father, we bless you today. We thank you, Father, for your grace and mercy that is so abundant and rich. Father, that you pour them out to your people. Father, that you've rescued us. You've rescued us, Father, from the profane, from the ordinary, from the pit, from the muck and the mire. You have rescued us and you have made us holy. Father, you have given to us your righteousness because Jesus took our sins. We thank you, God, that you have enacted such a bold plan to save us, that you have claimed us as your very own, and that whom you have taken in your hand, none can shake loose. <coughs> Nothing can separate us from your love. Nothing. Father, we lift this to you. I ask, Father, that you would settle in our hearts and our spirits <coughs> what you have done the magnitude of what you have done. We thank you, Father. Help us to be a people of praise and worship and thanksgiving. And we bless you for this, Father, in Jesus' name.